And welcome back to High School Physics Explained. And today we're dealing with the third in the series of thermodynamics that I'm doing. And today we're going to discuss the concept of latent heat. And what is this image that you see in front of you? Well, it's a photo I took of a conical flask with liquid nitrogen. And what you see here is that the liquid nitrogen, which is at a temperature of minus 198 degrees, is boiling. Because of the external environment being significantly warmer, of course, it was actually in room temperature, it's boiling. And liquid nitrogen having a very low boiling point. And of course, what is happening is we have a change of state. But the interesting thing is, as long as it's boiling and changing from a liquid to a gas, the temperature remains relatively constant, even though there is lots of energy going into the flask, causing it to change its shape. Why is its temperature not increasing? But before we discuss the concept of latent heat, we just need to remind ourselves of the concept of phase and how matter can exist in one of five phases. But of course, the most common ones are the four that you see here. The missing one is the Bose-Einstein condensate. And you know that if you put energy into any of these states of matter, they change states. So for example, a solid, of course, will melt to a liquid, will vaporize to a gas, and will ultimately ionize to a plasma. The reverse is that they can recombine to a gas, they can condense to a liquid, and then, of course, they can freeze to a solid. And of course, you also have sublimation and deposition, where a solid goes straight into a gas. Carbon dioxide is a good example of where a solid goes straight into a gas. That is, it sublimates. A quick reminder too, in a previous discu discussion in one of my videos, I talk about internal energy. Quickly looking at this fit animation, you can see here I have a representation of a solid and a solid's internal energy is a combination of both the kinetic energy and the potential energy. The kinetic energy, of course, is the translational motion and the average kinetic energy per particle is often linked to temperature. But of course, there is also potential energy, that is, these atoms themselves are bonded to each other and that's stored potential energy. If I have a liquid, what we have increased levels of kinetic energy, they're moving more, and so of course the temperature for that substance increases, but there is still interatomic bonding holding these atoms together, and of course there's also potential energy if these particles were, for example, compounds. So if I change this to water, then we also have the potential energy stored in between the hydrogen and the oxygen atoms. So the internal energy is not just one or the other, it's both kinetic and potential energy. If I were to go to a gas, then of course we have a considerable amount of kinetic energy. We don't have zero potential energy, although there is no bonds specifically between these atoms. Again, if these are molecules, then there is still some potential energy between the atoms. Nonetheless, that is what internal energy is. And it, the actual amounts of kinetic energy and potential energy obviously is going to be different, whether it is a solid, a liquid or a gas. So now having discussed that, let's have a look at a situation which is no doubt common a nice glass of iced tea and you throw in some ice and of course the ice starts maybe at minus five degrees Celsius. Eventually the water or the ice tea drops down to a temperature and it may get to let's say a zero degree Celsius temperature. Now the ice by this stage has also reached that zero degrees Celsius and so for a time the ice and the iced tea remain at zero degrees Celsius. And yet energy is constantly going into the glass. And what you see is that the ice is melting throughout the whole process because of the energy going into the glass. But if I measure the temperature, it remains relatively constant. So what is going on? Let's explore that further in terms of a graphical example. So if we talk about our ice here, the ice will start, let's say at minus five out of your freezer, and eventually will get to zero, where of course it will start to melt. Then as it remains in the glass, it remains constant. And then only after the ice has completely melted and gone into its liquid state, will you see a gradual increase in temperature. So what's going on? 
Well, in essence, the increase here in temperature is because the energy input, that is the heat transfer, causes the average kinetic energy to increase, which of course means you have an increase in temperature. This is true also over here where the state remains constant. Here it's staying as a solid, here it's staying as a liquid, and here again we have an increase in kinetic energy, which is of course about an increase in temperature. So what's going on here? Well, what's happening here is the energy input is causing the bonds to break between the various molecules of water. That is, we're going to change state. The solid water is turning to a liquid water, and it's because of the fact that there are bonds between the water molecules, which is making it a solid, is starting to break. And well, that requires energy. And so what we have here is a breaking of those bonds, and that's what's occurring here. The energy is going into, in terms of breaking the potential energy, or affecting the potential energy of my water that is going from a solid to a liquid. And that concept is referred to the latent heat. The latent heat is really the energy that's required to basically change the state of the substance from one phase to another. In other words, it's the amount of energy to make a certain amount, hence the M, of a substance to go from, let's say, a liquid to a gas or a solid to a liquid and so forth. And different substances will have different values for their latent heat. So we have this L value. But as I've just hinted, there are different versions of latent heat. In other words, when we look at latent heat, we could be looking at solid to liquid. In other words, energy input to go from solid to liquid, and of course, energy released if it goes from a liquid to a solid. And of course, and of course, we, we call that the latent heat of fusion. If the substance is going from a liquid to a gas, we're putting energy in to turn it into gas, we call that the latent heat of vaporization. And these are the two most common situations that you may encounter in terms of a latent heat. But as I also said, it is possible that you may get a solid going directly into a gas. And so we have this, what we call the latent heat of sublimation. Let me review that again. These energy values where these L values can be called the latent heat of fusion, latent heat of vaporization, or latent heat of sublimation, tells us how much energy is needed to be input to go from a solid to a liquid. And likewise, how much energy will be released if we convert the liquid back into a solid. So now let's examine our graph. And in this case, what we have here is any certain substance that is here increasing in temperature, it's remaining constant as energy goes input over here. And you can see the energy input is my x axis. And then, of course, we have an increase here, a flat line here, and an increase here. And in this case, because we are commonly using water, you can see what I have here is I've got zero here for the freezing point of water in degrees Celsius and the boiling point of water in 100. And of course, the scale will be different for different substances. And so the first thing you need to understand is that the energy required to go from negative 50 to zero is all about the specific heat capacity or that value. So this formula determines what's happening here. A change in temperature, of course, multiplied by the mass, multiplied by the specific heat of a particular substance. When we deal with, for example, here, it's the same. So it's the same concept here that we have in terms of the specific heat capacity. Now, the value will be different because the fact is, is that the specific heat of water is different for a liquid than it is for a solid. But if we now look at the situation where it plateaus, this is the latent heat of vaporization, where the water goes from a liquid to a gas. And similarly speaking, over here, we have the latent heat of fusion. So now what we have is a whole series of equations that tell us how much energy is needed, the in, in input, determining on whether we are increasing the temperature here or whether we are changing the state 
over here. So here is a table that looks at some various values for latent heat of fusion and vaporization. And I want to draw your attention specifically to water because it's the one that we are most familiar with. And so we have the latent heat of fusion is this value here, 3.33 by 10 to the power of 5. Now that is reasonably large. And if you compare that to all the other substances here, it's on the upper range of these substances. If you compare that to the latent heat of vaporization, you get 2.26 by 10 to the power of 6. In other words, what that is saying, for the same amount of mass, you need a lot more energy to turn a liquid water to a gas than you do to turn solid water to a liquid. Similarly speaking, the amount of energy released when a gaseous form of water, steam, turns into a liquid, it condenses, is significantly higher than, let's say, when it goes from a liquid to a solid. And that has implications in terms of uh, handling uh, water safely. And I'll discuss that in a moment. Let's have a look at our glass of iced tea again. And I have a question that says, look, I've got 320 mils of iced tea at 27 degrees. How much ice do I need in order to reduce this to zero degrees Celsius. The 27 degrees gives us a sense of how much energy in terms of specific heat capacity. And of course, that is related to this formula here. The iced tea is this, and we're gonna have a drop in temperature and we want it to drop 27 degrees. But the amount of energy that we drop as a result is gonna be transferred to the ice and that's going to cause the ice to melt. And if that's what we're interested in, the minimum amount of ice that we need to melt. And so that's going to be this formula here, which is the latent heat of fusion for ice. Now, if I put those two together and make them equal, what we get is this. We have the amount of energy due to the liquid water dropping in temperature. It's being that energy is being transferred to the ice, but it's of course causing it to melt. And mathematically, what does that do? Well, what you get is if you rearrange this, and we're interested in the mass of the ice, is that you can see that the mass of the ice, which is this value, is equal to the mass on this side multiplied by the specific heat. Now, then we have the change in temperature, and then, of course, we divide this by the latent heat of fusion. And when we work that out, we have the value for mass, which is 320 grams, or what we say is 0.32 kilogram. My specific heat of ice tea, strictly speaking, is pretty much the same as water. So that's going to be a value of, let's say, 4,186. Now, the temperature change is the variation. And what we're going is, is it's going to drop from 27, basically, down to zero. So you're going to get 27 minus zero. And then the latent heat of fusion for ice is 3.35 multiplied by 10 to the power of 5. And when you calculate that out, you get 0.11 kilograms. In other words, you need 110 grams, that's what this value is, of ice in order to reduce your glass of iced tea down to zero degrees. You can see this is actually all about conservation of energy. The energy released by the liquid iced tea must be conserved and it actually is in going into breaking the bonds that hold the solid ice together. So one final example of this at play is a practical example, and I excuse if this image uh, bothers you a little bit, but it's the issue of scalding. So why are steam burns worse than water burns? Well, the reason is, is if, if you have water, let's say at a particular temperature, let's say it's at 100 degrees, then what you're going to, of course, have is a burn. You're going to have a significant amount of energy going into your skin and damaging the skin. But if it's steam, then when it strikes your skin, not only do you have the energy transfer simply because of the temperature, 
but the steam itself has to go into a liquid state as it hits your skin. The skin is cooler and so the steam will of course condense, but that basically means you have a release of energy related to the latent heat of vaporization. So not only do you have a transfer of energy due to the temperature, you have a transfer of energy due to the gaseous form changing to a liquid form and releasing that energy related to the latent heat. And so you burn yourself much more significantly with steam than with water. Well, I hope that has given you a little bit of an understanding of the latent heat uh, and the change of state. My name is Paul from High School Physics Explained. Please like, share and subscribe. Take care. Bye for now.